Hello, I wanted to make this video because I think a lot of atheists and even some Christians struggle with why we would give authority or special authority to the Bible specifically, or more accurately, the collection of texts we've built into the canon of scripture over time, the Old Testament and the New Testament. I think a lot of Christians and a lot of atheists especially think the way we got the Bible was Constantine or some early person, maybe a pope, got together and just picked all the books randomly that agreed with his perspective. Um, this isn't true. Um, Constantine didn't even live to see the closing of the canon, as you might call it. What had happened was there was a more organic collection of what we would consider scripture that in many parts of Western Christendom weren't really settled until even the Protestant Reformation. So all of these books weren't picked or understood in some top-down way, but, as a, but in, in, in a bottom-up kind of way. So which books were you reading, uh, you know, if you were a Christian community, were mostly determined by what was being used by the liturgy, what were being used historically by your community, and in the Christian worldview, this would mean that we believe that the Holy Spirit was guiding the acceptance of Scripture. What books were being read and edifying Christians to turn them into righteous people that were turning them uh, into communities which were able to evangelize and spread their version of Christianity over other groups of Christians which might have prioritized uh, different texts over time. So you can read early church fathers who disagree about which books are canon uh, in, in a scriptural, infallible sense, and which books are just edifying to read, which books are, are completely out because they disagree with the continuity of the other scriptures, they don't have the same message. I think lots of uh, people today, cynical people, Christians, progressive Christians uh, mostly, and, and atheists, think that the reason some books were left out was because they had dangerous messages or something that the early Christians disagree with. But um, most of the time, it's just that they say something completely contradictory to what other things we had already accepted as scripture by this point. For instance, the Old Testament canon uh, was already codified in things like the Septuagint for early Christians to reference as, oh, these things are scripture. Now, eventually, Protestants and Catholics will disagree on what exactly is the Old Testament scripture. Is it what the early Christians recognized as scripture through the Septuagint, or is it what modern Jews uh, saw as their, you know, Tanakh, the full Bible, uh, the Jewish Bible, and whether or not some of those excess books end up in uh, different Bibles depends on whether or not you're Protestant or Catholic. I also think many Christians and atheists think that what the Bible is doing for Christians is a, an exact dictation of everything you must believe is physically true in a sense. Um, so lots of atheists or, or even Christians, fundamentalist and progressive alike, will find what the science says about something like the age of the earth and then how old the Bible claims the earth is in Genesis. If you use the text in a certain way that you can date the exact age by going back on how old people are uh, when they give birth until Adam and Eve, um, th they'll say, oh, look, this contradicts uh, carbon dating, for instance, which says this tree is older than the Bible uh, allegedly claims the earth is. But this is not how early Christians necessarily used the Bible, and it's not what the Bible claims the Bible is for. In uh, 2 Timothy, we can see St. Paul writing to one of his disciples, his name is Timothy, and instructing him on how to run a church. And when he's talking about the role of Holy Scripture, he says that it's perfect, perfect. So that's where we get the idea infallible. But is that it's perfect for teaching, reproof, doctrine, things uh, uh, that pertain to faith. So uh, moral issues, uh, uh, issues of, of church doctrine, dogma, things that relate to the Christian life and actually how you might live your life, um, that is, in, in, in those pronouncements, in those claims, the scripture is perfect or inerrant, um, breathed by God, Second Timothy says. But what it doesn't say is, oh, how old is the earth, which is a question that will never really affect how you have to make a decision in your life. I'm never going to have to decide whether or not to go to this place for breakfast and that place for breakfast. And the question is, how old is the earth? I mean, 
it's it's really not actually something pertinent to your daily life. So Christians are free to disagree about the age of the earth, even if they can take the Bible seriously. People will point out St. Augustine, who's living in the 300s, he doesn't have the modern um, scientific reasons to believe uh, that the Genesis story is non-physical. I say physical as opposed to literal because the Genesis story does have something to teach us that we should find uh, as authoritative. Um, but Augustine doesn't interpret Genesis 1 in the kind of literalistic, physicalist sense that we do today of six literal days. He, he, he thinks it's a logical contradiction. Why wouldn't God just create the universe instantaneously? Um, now, that's not exactly the modern perspective of old earth creationists or theistic evolutionists, but it, it does show that an honest Christian who takes the Bible seriously can differ with the idea of, of a six-day creation. What a faithful Christian might say about Genesis 1 is that when we're making a decision about our life, about faith, about doctrine, we should use Genesis 1 as a literal story about the fall of humanity and what's wrong with us and our rebellion in sin against God, not about dating the earth in a, in a, in a way that will never actually affect us. But we should treat it literally, saying that we should discard the story because it's not literal, I think diminishes the value and the actual uh, importance of Genesis 1. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in what is described as a God-breathed scripture. So now we've established the scope of the biblical text. We've established what uh, the Bible is supposed to be used for, um, moral teaching, the Christian faith, uh, and living, uh, instruction, doctrine, okay? But what, why the Bible? I think lots of uh, atheists, Christians, think that a bunch of people just found this book called the Bible and it was like laying on a table somewhere. They read it and they were like, wow, this is really great. I'm going to base my entire life off of this. What are some good reasons to uh, see the Bible as authoritative or perfect for teaching and reproof? Well, here are three reasons why I think it actually makes a lot of sense as someone who didn't used to think the Bible was authoritative when I was an atheist to get take the Bible seriously and then maybe to see it as something that has supernaturally been breathed into by God through the human authors of each text to do something special for humans, to take a special kind of role in our lives. Um, the first reason I would say is that the uh, Bible is unique in a way that other books aren't. So even religious texts aren't. So people will say, how do you know the Bible uh, is the authoritative word of God and not the Quran or the Book of Mormon or um, some Hindu text? Now, what those other books have is they're usually written by one author whose unity of purpose is obvious. So if the Quran doesn't contradict itself, well, th that makes sense. Why would Muhammad write something that contradicts what Muhammad says? Uh, if the Book of Mormon makes a uh, narrative sense and has a similar um, ethos as something to teach that, that's consistent throughout the Book of Mormon, um, that makes sense. Joseph Smith is the alleged author of the entire thing um, in, a, in a naturalistic sense. Of course, both of these people claim to be prophets. They claim to be people who uh, were spoken to by God to write these texts, uh, usually dictated word for word uh, as God's intention. So, there's nothing really that remarkable about them being, you know, particularly poetic or being particularly um, unique in any way. However, Scripture, that includes the Old Testament and the New Testament, has a unique quality, which is that it's written and claims to be written by dozens of authors who don't necessarily all fit the same time, place, setting, culture. And despite that, you can see that you know, there have been thousands of years of theology which unites all of the themes of the Bible. For instance, you can take a theme like um, water and go through the entire Bible and see the united message of being cleansed or saved or spared from sin or danger uh, and, and the theme of water and salvation. Soon I'll be releasing a video on baptism which will do just this. And if you're interested, you can watch that video. The second impressive thing about Holy Scripture is its predictive power. You can see in the book of Acts, um, a lot of the times that the apostles are preaching to somebody or they're trying to uh, share the gospel with them, whatever the word gospel means, that, that would be another 50-minute video on its own, but they're trying to share the gospel with people uh, about Jesus Christ. And where do they start? They start with the Old Testament. 
Jews and Gentiles alike are impressed by the fact that it seems like this Jesus guy fulfills loads and loads of Old Testament prophecies. Um, if you haven't already, I would recommend you read Isaiah 53, which is a chapter in an Old Testament book, and ask yourself, is this, does this feel like a New Testament description of Jesus or an Old Testament um, description of something else? Of course, this is the only text that I'm aware of other than maybe some weird, um, obscure, predictive text like Nostradamus or something, which made predictions about the future, about, in this case, the Messiah, and then watched as they unfolded undoubtedly hundreds of years later. Um, most critical scholars, when they're dating books of the Bible, will assume that they couldn't possibly have been predicted, uh, something that happened later. So, for instance, in the New Testament, when um, it, it seems like Jesus is predicting that the second temple in Jerusalem is going to fall, despite the fact that he only lived in the 30s, critical scholars will say, well, it must have been after 70 AD that this book was written um, because he couldn't have predicted this. And critical scholars can always get around admitting that something in the Bible predicted a genuine prediction of something that happened in history, except for the Old Testament texts, which we have record of existing for hundreds of years before Jesus, the Old Testament texts who predicted Jesus that are still recognized by Jewish communities today that don't follow Jesus. Now, I remember growing up, um, I, was, I grew up Jewish, and you'll hear a lot of people say, well, if Jesus really was the Messiah, then why are there people who keep the Old Testament and don't recognize the New Testament and don't recognize that he was the Messiah? And firstly, this was a part of the original predictions about the Messiah would be that there would be some of the quote-unquote faithful who would reject Jesus, but also it fulfills a, one of the many archetypes and symbols of the Old Testament narrative, which is that there is usually an older brother. So Cain and Abel is the first version of this. There's an older brother who wants to be loved by their father or God and expects God's love. And then a younger brother who's too busy making sacrifices for God and he's just worshiping God. And so God or the father figure in this, in whatever story we're talking about, chooses the younger brother over the um, entitled over brother, older brother. Jesus tells this story in the story of the prodigal son in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, this is a recurring theme. So, for instance, when um, Isaac has two children, he picks the younger brother to inherit his um, uh, primogeniture, his birthright. Uh, the same thing is actually true if you pay attention to the Abraham story, where he has an illegitimate older son and a younger son who is actually going to inherit his birthright. The same thing happens when Joseph returns from Egypt and he goes back to Canaan and he asks his father to bless his sons and his father uh, gives preferential treatment to his younger son over the older son. This is a theme that's fulfilled in the idea that there will be lots of Jews who, when confronted with the Messiah, actually reject him because the Messiah didn't come in the way that they wanted the Messiah to come and, and instead revealed that his kingdom was not of this world or, or a variety of things that upset um, the Jewish community, which was being oppressed by the Romans in a very physical sense. Jesus offered a narrative of uh, spiritual liberation of his coming of the kingdom of God in a way that wasn't um, a political solution, which lots of Jews rejected. I remember growing up as a Jew, wrestling with these issues when I was looking into Christianity and going to my rabbi, and to this day, the objection of the Jewish community in a large part is, well, we knew that the Messiah was going to come and establish a physical kingdom and be king of Israel in the same way that David was, um, because the Messiah is called the son of David and all these things. But really what this was doing was giving preferential treatment to traditions outside of scripture, which prove in a certain way that scripture was actually what was infallible, not the traditions that the uh, Jewish people were uh, practicing at the time. So the first two reasons to treat the Bible seriously were the unity of purpose over a large number of authors, and secondly, the predictive power of the, um, the Bible. The fact that prophecies actually come true that are described in the Bible. Um, 
in a definitive, unarguable way, even critical scholars have to acknowledge all of the messianic prophecies predate the existence of Jesus, and he did fulfill them. And there are many more than just Isaiah 53. But the third reason is this kind of extra-biblical testimony of Israel's unique relationship with God. What do I mean by this? Well, all of the Abrahamic religions, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, acknowledge that Israel, so the descendants of Abraham, had a unique relationship with God in a way that other people groups necessarily maybe did not. So even the Quran, which doesn't necessarily literally use the Old Testament uh, in, in its makeup in the same way that Christians do, where we just acknowledge the Old Testament was scripture, even the Muslims in that area acknowledge that there was a special relationship there, or there was uh, the history described by the Old Testament is in a lot of ways true. Now, this is the, does this mean that on its own, this would prove just because a lot of people believe that the Jewish community had a special relationship with God? No, it doesn't. But this is a, a cumulative argument for the uniqueness of the Bible, because if a lot of people seem to find it undeniable that the Jewish community had some kind of special relationship with God, well, we might as well look at what they were saying. And then the previous two reasons, the predictive power and unity of purpose, seem to vindicate that, that, that claim that the Jewish community had a unique relationship with God. The same thing seems to be true about Jesus. One of the interesting things that I found out when I was investigating Christianity from my previously Jewish perspective was that the traditional Jewish take on Jesus isn't that he didn't exist. Um, it's that he did exist. And it's not that he didn't perform miracles, it, it, that he did perform magic tricks, but what they would treat Jesus as a sorcerer. And in Islam, Jesus is not not recognized as the Messiah. He is recognized as the Messiah. So again, it seems like everybody in this region, all of the religions coming out of this area, have to in some way account for this Jesus guy. And so you have to start asking yourself, okay, well, what was the real Jesus like? And then do your, the investigative work and look into the reliability of the Gospels. Uh, and it starts to unravel that I think one of these perspectives has to be true, which famously C.S. Lewis summarized as the Lord, liar, lunatic um, allegory or a, a question or an analogy, which is um, if Jesus was real and the Jesus described by these religious texts actually was the way he's being described, um, he's either Lord, so everything he said was true, he is God, he is God incarnate, he's the Messiah, all this stuff, um, or he's a liar, so he knew that he wasn't these things um, and told people anyway and all this stuff, or he was a lunatic, so he believed he was God, but um, wasn't. And I think the reason it's hard to believe that is it seems like most of these most people who encounter uh, Jesus seem to think he is at least acknowledged to be a good guy. Um, most people, the way C.S. Lewis puts it is, is you'll find he was a good teacher. Most people will acknowledge just reading the New Testament. You'll say, okay, you know what? This guy seems like a genuinely good, you know, good fella. But it doesn't really make sense if he's supposed to be some kind of raving lunatic who believes he's God. It seems hard for someone to ontologically believe that they um, are God incarnate and not have some cognitive dissonance that it's hard to address. So what will happen a lot of the time is um, most prophets or false prophets don't necessarily believe they literally are God or the God who created the universe in the Jewish sense. They either believe they're an incarnation of a, of a deity who is a polytheistic deity, or they believe they're being spoken to by God. Um, but even most people don't believe they instantially are God and then can also spout lots of, of really valuable wisdom at the same time. They would have to be a lunatic. And so the same question can be asked about Jesus, and you should investigate these things. Um, and a lot, a lot of times people will say, oh, maybe he's just a legend that's accumulated. But this is the very thing that the earlier testimony is disputing, because if you believe the Gospels are reliable, if you find it odd that all of these communities have to have an explanation for this miracle worker, it does start to seem like this Jesus guy was exactly the way that he's described in the Gospels. So legend is a 
rejection rather than an acceptance of the premise and, and dealing with the issues. So it seems like everybody has to it, say something about who this Jesus guy was. And actually, the same thing is true about the Jewish community before Jesus. Um, the reason I started this with the Jewish community is because it's, it's, it certainly seemed like an important revelatory community that had a unique relationship with God. Again, all of these people recognize this unique relationship. So one of the questions of history is how has the Jewish community survived despite the thousands and thousands of years of this contiguous community? Um, there have been ethnicities which have come about and totally vanished in the time frame that Jews have, you know, multiplied, been persecuted, been multiplied and persecuted, um, and still survived. Um, additionally, it's, it seems like um, Christianity uh, that, that came out of Judaism or Islam that came out of Judaism are weirdly some of the most successful religions. So something that the Jewish community found and was saying and thought was valuable, it seems to think, it seems to me that all of the rest of the world also felt was valuable and accepted mostly religions based off of this core Judaism, which um, has in, in, in certain ways either been fulfilled in one of the successor religions or at least was initially correct on its own. So then you start to dwindle down to which of the three religions do you think are more likely to be true? And you can go back and do the exact same examination process that we just did with Jesus, where you have three options. Um, and, and really the question, I think, that differentiates these three religions is Jesus again. So it was Jesus Lord. So that would make you a Christian. Was he a liar, which would, I think, make you a Jew, because their explanation for all of his miracles and stuff would be that he was a sorcerer. Or, and, I, and I'm butchering maybe a little bit the Muslim position, um, because I don't wouldn't say they think he was a lunatic, but would you say that he was just a prophet of some kind? Did he claim to be God would be the question that would differentiate you between being a Muslim or a Christian, because Muslims do acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah and was a, a very valuable prophet. So this gets back to the Bible. Why does it matter if Jesus was God? Couldn't it have been that Jesus was God and all of his message was true? You'll find this a lot on TikTok or in New Age places, that Jesus really was God incarnate and his message has been corrupted. You'll even find this in some Christian communities. This doesn't exactly align with what Jesus promised. Jesus didn't promise that he would give a message and then it was up to us to preserve that message. Instead, he describes a church that he's going to establish on earth. And then you get the different Christian denominations, but basically he says that he's going to build his faith on a rock. You know, he, Peter infamously is a part of this, whether or not Peter himself and his office or something like the Pope uh, would be the uh, successor of this promise or whether or not it was Peter's confession that Jesus was Lord is the important part, is a conversation for the denominations. But... The real question at the core is whether or not Jesus established a church and sent his Holy Spirit upon the apostles, as described in Acts, to preserve his church. So if Jesus was Lord and he established this church community, which would have his spirit of uh, protection so that they would never fail, Jesus infamously said that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. Um, if this guy said all this stuff, and he promised to give us a church, and we've got that church, and that church can't fail, that church is going to come up with a Bible, and that church said that the Bible was, uh, you know, these many books, and it was authoritative in this way. So some people will point, yes, 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 you claim all this stuff about Jesus, and you claim this stuff about the church, and you claim this stuff about being given a Bible for operation as the church, but don't Tons of Christians disagree about what's in the Bible, what is the Bible, what's not. The Christian community prior to the Protestant Reformation, in large swathes, agreed on what books were really important to the Christian community. And by the time of the Protestant Reformation, there were doctrines based off of books that even early church fathers like Jerome doubted the entire the infallibility of not that they weren't good books and that they weren't edifying so for instance there's a book about the maccabees who were a jewish community that revolted against uh, a greek oppressor 
that we get the holiday Hanukkah from. And this book doesn't seem to uh, early Christians to have had the same kind of authority as, for instance, an infallible book of scripture. So arguments over these uh, extra books, which are usually called deuterocanonical books, or sometimes more derisively apocryphal books, being compared to books that were rejected from the canon, um, the, the debate on the authority of these books kind of lingered on until the 1500s. So if you'd like to get into de debating whether or not these books are infallible, as maybe the Roman Catholic tradition would say, or whether or not they're just edifying, which was the actual position of all the Protestant reformers, was that these books were good books to be read, to be included in the Bible, but that they weren't infallible and they couldn't have doctrines built upon the precepts in these books. So Maccabees, Tobit, Baruch, other things like this that are debatable whether or not they're in, they, they carry the charism of infallibility. So just because there is some dispute on a certain set of books that the Christian community universally acknowledged to be valuable, doesn't really mean that the other books that all of these Christians acknowledge to be infallible, like the Gospels, like the Epistles, like Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy, um, it doesn't mean that, that their universal acclaim, the universal uh, acclamation of the church that those books are uniquely infallible no longer carries weight. Because again, like I said, if Jesus came to earth, promised us an inf a, a church which would not universally err or abandon the gospel, and the church universally acknowledges anything, right? So doctrine or uh, the biblical canon, it seems like that thing must be true because of that promise of the lack of defectibility, as it's called in theological area. The, the church is indefectible. So even if the church retreats for a long time into a small corner of the world, um, so an example of this would be the Arian crisis. It seems like there were heretics in charge of most of the church for a large period of the early history, but there was a documented, um, historically recognized large portion of the church, which was still faithful to the um, theologically lowercase o orthodox opinion for a large period of time. So um, we can say, okay, that was the true church. We know this because later that version of the church's opinion was universally adopted by the church, not... Um, the Arian position, as it's called. So we can trace the Orthodox, lowercase o, Orthodox Church, all the way back to Jesus through the writings of early church fathers. This comes to the last reason I would say we can't trust what I call the Constantine objection. The Constantine objection, like I referenced earlier, is that Constantine or the Pope or some organized group changed Christian doctrine fundamentally. Now, the reason this doesn't really work is because we have loads of early church fathers like Ignatius or Justin Martyr uh, prior to the Nicene Creed where Constant Constantine called a council of the leaders of the church to come together to clarify doctrine. And we can find the doctrine that they clarified at Nicaea in those early church fathers, which go back to, for instance, Ignatius was writing in uh, uh, dies in 108 AD. So, he was probably, a, you know, church tradition tells us he was alive to meet all of the apostles or a lot of the apostles, right? Jesus dies in AD 33 and he dies in 108. So he, he's a pretty reliable source on what the practice of the early church was like. And we have documents like the Didache, which detail the practices of the early church, which are still practiced today, like baptism and, and all of these things. So we can pretty clearly identify the practices of the universally acknowledged uh, church is as early uh, as the earliest followers we have records of in, in the church community. And the reason the Bible is so important, like I said earlier, is despite differences between how the Bible is incorporated into Christian denominations, views of authority, for instance, there are denominations which believe in the authority of bishops, like the Anglican and the Orthodox, who say that the bishops have this kind of binding and loosing authority, which they find in the Bible. And then there's the Roman Catholic system, where the Pope has this authority to bind doctrine upon the entire church. Or more low church Protestants who just believe in what's called the regulative principle of worship, that they don't think anything can be established unless it's obvious in Scripture, or that something can't be, uh, that tradition really doesn't have an authority to them. And so you might say, look, Christians disagree on all this stuff. 
But what they don't disagree on is the universal value and infallibility in matters of teaching, doctrine, and faith that Scripture holds. And so Scripture remains at the center of Christianity. And so if you can establish the authority, the infallibility, the uniqueness, the predictive quality of Scripture, you can set a firm foundation for Christian faith. Thank you for watching. I hope that video was concise and understandable. Um, sometimes I tend to ramble and make weird points, but if you made it this far, I appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, comment if you disagree or if you have thoughts on what I've said. Um, if you want to support me, um, you can support me at younganglican.locals.com. These are my uh, lovely supporters already. Uh, I Without them, I wouldn't be able to put as much time into uh, the, the, making these videos as I currently do. So thank you so much for watching uh, and God bless.